From KGW, this is The Good Stuff. Tonight on The Good Stuff, the Rose Festival is in full swing with our second parade of the season. Thanks for joining us. I'm Deidre Johnson. Children and teens took center stage earlier today for the Junior Parade. It was perfect weather in the Northeast Portland area with a breeze as the dance teams and marching bands made their way through the Hollywood District. It's been an official Rose Festival event since 1936 and it's the largest children's parade in the nation. The big Grand Floral Parade happens this Saturday morning. And many welcomed those that serve our country to Portland as ships began to arrive for Fleet Week. Hundreds of members of the military will be here for the event. Tours of the ships start tomorrow. The ships will head out on Monday. It's cool. I'm still waiting to see them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll be down here tomorrow to paint them. So I'm looking forward to that because you don't see it every day. I, I think it's beautiful. It's fun to watch. It's fun to see the kids watch it and the community and the beautiful day. A total of five ships will dock along the waterfront, including two from Canada. Again, ship tours begin tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. and run through four in the afternoon. The Friends of the Multnomah County Library is celebrating six months in business. They want the community to know what the store in Northeast Portland has to offer. John Goodwin shows us how the nonprofit gets their books and where the money goes. We are here for this community and any other community that wants to come here. If you judge Rose City Reads by its cover, you might miss the catalog of character inside. We are an advocacy organization for the local library. Jackie Starr is the executive director of Friends of the Multnomah County Library. The nonprofit operates Rose City Reads and provides funds for library programs. The library has different programs and services that they might not necessarily have budgeted for or have the funds for. So they'll come to Friends of the Library and ask us for monies for different type of programs. Since they opened in December, they've sold 27,000 books and hit $100,000 in sales. We want to put the very best here because we want people to have a good shopping experience. Books come in as donations from the public or as retired books from the library. Peggy Holiday is one of the volunteers working in the sort room. I really like sorting the books. I'm, I'm a book nerd. I used to own a bookstore and um, so I missed that when I retired and now I get to play with books all the time when I come here. I find a lot of books that I want. <laughs> On June 5th, Rose City Reads is celebrating six months of this new chapter at Northeast 122nd and Gleason. They moved from the Library Operations Center on Northeast Russell. We were like in a basement area, happy to have the space, but it was nowhere near this magnitude. And it's not just a bookstore, it's a community resource. Volunteer Marguerite Shum lives just a 10 minute walk away. I want folks to know we're here, first and foremost. I want people in the neighborhood to know that we're here because this is such a cool little hidden gem in our neighborhood. All the sales benefit Multnomah County Libraries. The average price of a book, just three dollars. People feel like they say, I feel like I'm stealing away from you, you know. So we know, no, 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 buy the books. That's what they're here for. We want them to be affordably priced. There are over 15,000 books for you to flip through. The store even has LPs, audiobooks, CDs, and DVDs. I mean, it's just like a cool place to, yeah, find a hidden treasure. Come and check us out. I think they'll really like what they see and what they experience. In Northeast Portland, John Goodwin, KGW News. The first Wednesday of every month is a good energy day here at KGW. We highlight people, businesses, and organizations doing good things for the environment. Today, we tackle the issue of carbon emissions from greenhouse gases. Northwest Natural is working with a company that may have a solution. Chris McGinnis shows us. We're producing hydrogen as we speak on site, and that hydrogen is going into our system and it's displacing fossil gas. Starting with a rate of about 0.2%, the hydrogen blended at Northwest Natural's Southeast Portland facility is a first among major gas utilities in North America. And we rip the carbon out of the methane and deliver decarbonized natural gas or deliver hydrogen. The resulting carbon, I mean, that directly came out of the air. Seattle-based Modern Hydrogen uses methane pyrolysis to separate methane into its components. Hydrogen, which burns cleanly with comparable heat, 
and Solid Carbon Black, a secondary product that has tons of real-world uses. Think tires, pigments, and asphalt. So we're excited to see if this technology works, how reliable it is, does it deliver on its efficiency claims, and if it does all that, how do we scale this up as quickly as possible to decarbonize our customers directly? The urgency? There are about 3 million miles of pipeline in the United States, delivering 29 trillion cubic feet feet of natural gas to about 78 million customers every year. Burning methane, the primary gas in that stream, emits CO2, a global warming gas, to the tune of 1.7 gigatons per year. That's equivalent to the annual emissions of 370 million cars. So placing one of these modern hydrogen scrubbers in every neighborhood could solve a big problem. So one scenario we're looking at is deploying these units in front of residential areas and making hydrogen, scrubbing out the carbon, and blending that into the natural gas stream to get upwards of 20% by volume hydrogen delivered to every residential customer. Is it as effective? Does it burn as hot? Does it do the same thing that regular natural gas does? There's been tests of these, uh, of, of blending tests all over the world. In Europe, our, the customers didn't notice anything that was different with a 20% blend. And to the dozens of industrial sized customers across the region? I'm gonna put this box at the end of the line, right before your facility. We're gonna remove the carbon and you, factory operator, are gonna have 100% decarbonized operations and you don't have to change anything about your business. How does that sound? They have extremely large gas loads. They already have equipment that can be modified to accept large percentages of hydrogen and they're used to having retrofits done. So we can decarbonize our largest customers very efficiently, very at low cost and use you know, large scale ups Chris McGinnis, KGW News. To give a little love to Mother Nature, we want to recognize that today is World Environment Day. We know that you love, of course, to get out there. So we posted this to our Facebook page, asking you to share a pic of your favorite place out in nature, and you sent in some gorgeous photos. So we start with John, who sent in this pic from the gorge looking at Mount Hood. The mountain looks absolutely beautiful against the sky. Check it out. And Chelsea sent in this pic from Pacific City, looking at the Haystack Rock. With views like that, it's hard not to love the coast. Oh, love that. And Nora says she loves to spend time at the Ridgefield Wildlife Refuge, which looks so lush and green in that picture. Wow, amazing. And then Matt says his favorite place in nature is the Hebgun Lake near West Yellowstone. He added that he loves to be there at sunrise. And look, I mean, we can certainly see why. And finally, Veronica says she loves walking along Agency Creek Road on the Grand Ronde Reservoir. She says it's so peaceful and quiet. And of course, we agree it's one of the best parts of spending time out in nature. Now, you can share your photos and stories of the good stuff happening in your community by texting 503-226-5088 or email us at thegoodstuff at kgw.com. When school is out for the summer, some families struggle just to put food on the table. KGW is trying to help with that, and China Green shows us how. KGW and Safeway are teaming up to bag summer hunger. This is a 10 decade tradition here in Portland, and it's, ne it's never been needed more than it is today. It's all in hopes of keeping food on the table for families with children in need because hunger doesn't happen only around the holidays. Hunger isn't seasonal. Summertime is a busy time. We have well over 100,000 children in the Portland metro area that rely upon their schools for free or reduced lunches. And so what happens when school gets out? A lot of families don't have that resource. It's hard, uh, it's hard to get to summer lunch programs. Maybe you live far away from your school. The Sunshine Division is the partnering food bank that will distribute the bags. This is kind of our distribution center, if you will where the food starts, but then it ultimately it's going to end at, at someone's home. The hunger bags are filled with everything a child would need, including things like protein, pasta, peanut butter, beans, and vegetables. Things that are going to be the building blocks of real meals for people. The program runs June 5th through July 2nd, and it's easy to help. It's easy to make a difference. Just ask your clerk to purchase a $5 or $10 hunger bag at checkout. That money is going into a fund, and it's going to turn into actual bags of food or pallets of food in some instances. For the families who need the extra help this summer, the bags are available for pickup at either Sunshine Division Warehouse or, if that's not a possibility, 
who can schedule a delivery. We have a responsibility to be there to help people because it's the right thing to do. And if you want to help bag summer hunger, you can purchase those bags of food items at your local Safeway. For more information on how you can help, go to bagsummerhunger.com or kgw.com. Ahead on The Good Stuff, honored with a museum exhibit and a world record, the life and legacy of one of Portland's most influential figures. But first, let's take a quick trip up the mountain with our Timberline Skycam. Mount Hood is looking so pretty in the sunlight. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We have a new Pride Month edition of our Breaking Barriers series to share this evening. We look at the life and legacy of the legendary drag queen, Darcel. Christine Pitawanich has more. Decades of LGBTQ plus advocacy runs through Portland's veins, due in no small part to a legendary performer. No business like show business. For over 50 years, Walter Cole, or as you may recognize him better, Darcel, fearlessly advocated for the LGBTQ plus community. Cole was born in late 1930 and grew up in Northwest Portland. In the early 50s, Cole married his high school sweetheart before going off to serve in the army for a tour of duty in Italy. He returned and started a family, but eventually came out as a gay man. I had to come grip and grip with who I am and who I and that I was lying, and and um, I told my wife that I was gay. After I told her, I met Roxy. If I hadn't met the two of them, there wouldn't be a Darcel. The highlight, I think, is is exactly that: be who you are. And before that curtain comes up, your nerves your nerves are just as tight as it would if it was with the first night you ever worked. Cole got into drag for the first time after buying a rundown tavern in the late 60s. 
Throughout the 70s and 80s, Darcel became a headline act at a tavern he owned in Old Town that became Darcel 15 Showplace. Despite some protests outside the club, Cole insisted it was for everyone. And by the late 80s, it had become a Portland staple. Darcel was heavily involved with various charity efforts, and in 2016, the Guinness Book of World Records recognized Darcel as the world's oldest drag performer. More recently, Cole has been honored with a list of accolades, including an honorary knighthood from the Royal Rosarians and an Oregon Historical Society exhibit on Darcel's fashion. In March of 2023, Cole died at the age of 92, leaving behind a legacy of advocacy and giving back to the community. Darcel 15 Showplace will live on, now run by Cole's son, Walter, who goes by Junior. Today, the city of Portland is working on revitalizing Darcel 15 Plaza, renamed from O'Brien Square, to create a welcoming and inclusive space where all feel comfortable being themselves, just as Darcel would have wanted. Coming up, a special sporting event gives athletes of all abilities a chance to flex their skills in a big competition. The inspiring story up next. But before we go, we stop by the coast with our Cannon Beach Sky Cam, a gorgeous shot of the sun as it begins to set. Stay with us. Our next story takes us across the Columbia River. Last Friday, Kelso High hosted the annual No Limits Track Meet. Our Edward shares why the annual event means so much to the community. Joe Stewart Track at Kelso High is the perfect place for a track meet. About 200 athletes, all students in Southwest Washington and all with disabilities, got to show off their skills. It's just incredible. There's smiles, there's cheering, there's clapping in every direction. You, you, can't, you can't take more than a couple steps without hearing something being celebrated and somebody having a fun time. Some of the events are a little unusual for a track meet, like the bowling ball push, Go! wheelchair and trike races, and some of the throwing events. 
There are also the events that you might recognize, the long jump, and of course, the sprints. For the athletes, this is a big deal. It's a lot of fun. I've been doing, uh, I did this three years, so it's a lot of fun having uh, to do this every year. Cheerleaders from Toledo High were on hand to support the athletes and even a bumblebee mascot. While it's big fun for those competing, the student volunteers get excited as well. well it's fun seeing all their smiles and how happy they get after a race or throwing the softball, how happy they are. It's just, it's just super fun to see everyone all happy and everything. The parents of the athletes can't say enough about what happens at this special event. I mean, he wants to be a part of absolutely everything and try everything, and it, it's amazing. And my oldest, uh, he's not as jumping to be out and involved, so when people are pulling him in and giving him that opportunity and watching him light up, that's huge as well. Such a great event. Well, we're already halfway through the week. Stay with us for some community events happening in the Portland metro area this weekend. As you know, this is a big week for the Rose Festival. And with the weekend fast approaching, here are some other local events to get you out and about. We start with the Portland Horror Film Festival now underway. It features horror classics and shorts. And this year, the films will play in two venues. The first films will be shown at the Hollywood Theater through Friday. And then more films will be shown at the Clinton Street Theater on Saturday and Sunday. Tickets start at $25 at the box office or online at thehollywoodtheater.org. And if you're looking for a unique experience, you might want to check out the interactive exhibit Fathom. It's off Southwest 4th Avenue by Portland artist collective Roboto Octopato. More than 30 artists worked on the immersive underwater art experience. This is a great one for the kids who can run around and open glowing chests and even lounge in a giant clam. The exhibit is open Friday through Sunday until June 30th. 
For our 21 plus crowd, why not check out the Made with Pride Wine Showcase? It's happening this Sunday at the Community Wine Bar in Southwest Portland. The event will feature wine and food from many LGBTQ plus owned wineries and food vendors in Oregon. Tickets will cost you about $25 in advance and of course 30 at the door. Proceeds will help youth experiencing homelessness. For more information, head to communitywinebarpdx.com. And finally, the Sisters Rodeo is back in Central Oregon. The biggest little show in the world starts today with the Extreme Bulls Bull Riding Show. It runs through Sunday. The show features professional rodeo performances, a parade, and even live music. Tickets start at $22. You can head to sistersrodeo.com for more information. For more weekend inspiration, check out the 8 Things to Do article up each week on kgw.com. Well, that's all the time we have. Thanks for taking a little time for the good stuff. We leave you with a few more of your gorgeous nature photos as we wish you all a wonderful evening. Good night.